Hello, we're clinicians. This is Ali Nase, and we're back here with Dr. Michael Lewis, a Master Clinician and Endodontist, the Director of Foundation Endodontics at TNEC, New Jersey, as well as on the faculty at the Hackensack University Medical Center. Michael, thanks again for joining me. Pleasure. So, Michael, this case, very interesting. Seems like an open apex tooth with a lesion, clearly a history of trauma because the tooth next to it has had a previous root canal. Uh, and also appears like it may have a lesion as well. But uh, why don't you take the case and walk us through it? Sure. 14 year old female presented to me with uh, mild pain to percussion on tooth number nine, mild pain to probing on tooth number nine. Radiographically, we see uh, two areas of, of radi radiolucencies at the, at the apex of eight and nine, fairly large. And uh, we, I recommended uh, that we start with regenerative endo on tooth number nine. That was the patient's chief complaint. And I was a little concerned about the op large opening to the, of the apical frame in there, a blunderbuss apex, fairly parallel sided walls, not much resistance form. Uh, we went ahead, opened the tooth up, and we proceeded to just trying to gauge the apical foramen, what you're looking at in this image over here is actually a size 80 cone, which has really no apical binding whatsoever. I'd probably estimate the size of that apical foramen in the 140, 150 region. And the, uh, basically at that point, we irrigated with sodium hypochlorite uh, and disinfected the, cana the canal and left some calcium hydroxide in with the, with the intention of later on opening up at the second visit inducing a clot and hoping, hopefully getting some, some uh, regenerative endo going. Patient came back to me three weeks later, and if you look at that middle slide with that black substance in the, in the uh, orifice of the tooth, you're, you're looking at, I didn't know what was going on. I took an x-ray, which is the image on the left over there, and I see my, my cavity is totally gone and it looks like it's been driven down to the apical third of the tooth. What actually had happened was, is this patient had uh, basically been chewing on a mechanical pencil, and she had driven the, gutter, the, uh, the cavit down to the apical third. I guess she was in a rush to obturate it. Mm. Anyway, we went ahead and cleaned out those mechanical pencil fragments, the graphite fragments, uh, carefully teased out the cavity, making sure that we didn't drive it any further apically into the periapical tissues, and cleaned it up again. Uh, at this point, I kind of switched gears and said, maybe patient compliance here might be an issue. I also felt a little more comfortable looking at this tooth, that maybe there was a little bit more resistance form than I first appreciated. And we switched gears and said, all right, let's just go ahead and do some one-visit apexification using some BCRM putty. You mean you didn't uh, use the new, newly invented graphite plug technique? You know, as, as tempting as that was, Alan, <laughs> I, uh, I, I thought the, the BCRM might be a slightly better choice. <laughs> okay. So we, uh, at, at this point, I had just really started using the BCRM putty. This was actually back in 2012, 2013. I can't remember the exact year. And I really didn't gauge how much uh, putty to use. So I actually ended up really compressing a large amount of putty into this tooth. What I, the technique that I used was I uh, basically put the RM putty in, took a wet cotton pellet, used it a, uh, a condenser, and pressed that wet cotton pellet. Just took some mid-op radiographs until I got that putty flowing down into the apical third in the location that I wanted. Little, uh, you know, you got, you got to be a little technique sensitive here in terms of making sure you don't drive that that put it too far, but as we all know, the properties of that RM are so kind to the periapical tissues, I wasn't too concerned about getting a slight overfill. In any event, I was happy with where the, uh, the obturation material ended up, I was happy with the control at the end, and I was fairly confident that, that we got a nice apical barrier there. Uh, just moving forward to the next slide, we see here the immediate post-op radiograph, and we sent her back to the general dentist for a coronal rest for basically a, a composite restoration. Patient, uh, this is again of another post-op image. And just moving forward, patient came back to me one year later, and at that point we had a CBCT, 
and I took an image of tooth number nine and tooth number eight. Looking at tooth number eight, we can appreciate while well, in two dimensions that tooth might look fairly well obturated. When you look at a cross section of it in three dimensions, you're looking at a nice periapical lesion forming there at the base of number eight. And uh, you're looking at number nine, you're seeing the beginnings of trabecular bone fill into that area. Uh, you can, and if you look at the post-op radiograph, I think on the next image, you can start to see the PDL forming around that tooth. Patient was asymptomatic and really felt quite good, good on number eight, on number nine. And tooth number eight, I recommended retreatment. Unfortunately, the patient, because she wasn't symptomatic, the, the father did not feel compelled to really go ahead with treatment and, and respectfully declined. There's clearly a lesion there. You're absolutely right. There's probably something going on, but apparently they decided that it's not something they want to do. Um, do you feel like, uh, obviously, this patient may have inadvertently, uh, you know, discovered the, the graphite obturation technique, but uh, do you think, like, when you look at tooth number nine here on, the, uh, uh, on this uh, sagittal section, you can see that area on the buccal cervical area is fairly closed. Do you think that, she, that those mechanical pencil things with the hub, she kind of pressed it too hard? Luckily, you didn't see any uh, perf or anything like that after cleaning all that stuff out, did, did you? It's definitely closed, uh, but no, I, there was no evidence of any perforation at that point at all. Um, and it, again, if there is, it's probably filled in with BC putty and yeah. just fine. She really came back. Be fine. Yeah. No, no probing depths whatsoever. I was kind of surprised to see that, but yeah. clinically, it did not seem to be any any sequela of, of as a result of that at all. So, well, I mean, when, when you look at that an artifact, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, when you look at this uh, x-ray of the tooth when the patient came back to see you, you can almost imagine what she'd been sitting there doing with the, with the tooth. And it reminds me, when I was 14, I probably would have done something like that as well, just to do my own experimentation. Uh, but, but you did a great job there, and you basically saved uh, this patient's tooth um, from herself. Uh, let me ask you a question. In terms of your decision to fill with the putty the entire tooth, one of the things that I have um, uh, done myself and I've kind of described in the past uh, in our channel is if we fit a cone, I got to approach a cone all the way to the end and then cut off like three, four, three millimeters from the end of it, then that could become like a custom fitted plugger for that root, which you could then cut off the equivalent amount uh, of the, the, of the got to approach a plug that you cut off, put an equivalent amount of putty a little bit more next to it and then drive it down and you will end up getting a four millimeter putty plug at the apex. And what I have done in those cases, is instead of filling the rest of it with the putty, then I just backfill with the BC sealer as a backfill because that's much faster and you know, that uh, is a little bit easier than continuously plugging it. So, a little cheaper uh, too. <laughs> a little cheaper too, Alan. Huh? A little cheaper too. You're absolutely right. So that 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 might be a little workaround. I figured I, I will share with you just in case you in the future run into it. But but I think you did the right thing, not trying to do a uh, a, a revitalization at this point because I I certainly think all that foreign body that may have been inserted into the tooth would have definitely been a difficult thing to completely render sterile and, and clean up afterwards. Definitely one of these, one of the first cases I actually used with the BCRM putty. I think uh, I've gotten a little bit more judicious in how much putty that I use in these cases as time has gone on. But definitely one of the earlier cases that I've done with it, but it's definitely a fun. No, absolutely. And to be honest, you know, a lot of times people say, well, if you fill the whole thing up in a tooth like this with the putty, it'd be very difficult to retreat. In fact, what I have found in straight roots, uh, Michael, and if you could probably play around with this on extracted teeth yourself, when you have a, uh, if you could fill the entire root, as long as it's straight, uh, your ultrasonic tip with water will go through the set material almost like butter. It's, it's very easily removed with ultrasonics and water after it sets, as long as it's a straight path and it's not around the curve. So I've, a lot of times in my trauma cases like this, where you have an open and apex, uh, I just backfill the whole thing with the sealer or um, even with the putty and so on as well, because it's easily retreatable uh, with ultrasonic and water. And this technique is, you know, has been described in the past using MTA, and that has always been okay. The, 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 the beauty of the putty is that it doesn't stain the tooth like some of the MTA formulations does.
Definitely a big advantage. I'm a big Absolutely. fan. Absolutely. Well, M- Michael, thank you so much for spending your time with me and uh, sharing these beautiful cases with our audience. I'm sure it was very educational for all of them. So, uh, once again, uh, Dr. Michael Lewis, Director of Foundation in the Donics over at Teaneck, New Jersey, as well as uh, on the faculty at the uh, Hackensack University Medical Center. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Alan. For Real Dendo, I'm Ali Nase, and I hope you found this information helpful. 